Okay, we're in Daniel chapter five this evening. And you'll remember in um, Daniel chapter six that we were talking about Nebuchadnezzar's um, pride and how God turned the guy around. In fact, uh, um, uh, in uh, uh, Daniel chapter um, uh, four, did I, did I mix up those chapters? Daniel chapter four uh, was about pride. Daniel chapter five is also about pride. Chapter four was about Nebuchadnezzar's pride and it is also one of the passages in the Bible that is actually written by a Gentile. And um, it's uh, kind of a cool one because what you see God doing is taking this guy's heart and in a pretty radical way, he turns it around. Um, he actually makes the guy act like a, like a cow uh, for, it looks like seven years. It may just be seven seasons, but um, you have that whole thing. And what you have with Nebuchadnezzar is a man who turns and begins following the Lord. Um, in the next chapter, you have pretty much the, the same type of situation with another ruler of Babylon, and he's most likely a grandson or a great-grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. But this guy is walking in pride, and he doesn't turn. And uh, he gets himself into a situation where uh, he... Um, blasphemes God in ways that were not good. And he ends up being judged by God because of it. And so both those chapters are about pride. Um, this one deals with Belshazzar. And this, is, this chapter is also all about Belshazzar's feast. I'm just talking about the whole issue of pride. I have a, I have a couple of stories here. Um, when I was a kid, there was a guy named Muhammad Ali. And actually he spoke at my graduation. And so I got to meet him, shook his hand. And uh, yeah, that was pretty cool. Muhammad, but Muhammad Ali was a notorious fathead. <laughs> he, just, he thought he was the greatest. And there was a, there was a situation where he was on a plane. It's a, uh, the story goes that during the days when Muhammad Ali was a great boxer, he would go around in his arrogance and say that he was the greatest. Humility was never his strong suit. One day back in his prime, he was on an airplane and the plane was ready to take off. The flight attendant had repeatedly told him to put on his seat belt. He finally told her, I'm Superman and Superman don't need no seat belt. <laughs> Superman don't need no airplane either, retorted this, the stewardess. <laughs> I thought that was pretty good. Here's another one. Um, years ago, Keith Miller uh, writes this, years ago when our daughters were very young, we dropped them off at our church's children's chapel on Sundays before the 11 o'clock service. One Sunday, just as I was about to open the door to the small chapel, the minister came rushing up. He said he had an emergency and asked if I'd speak to the children at their story time. And he said the subject was the 23rd Psalm. Just as I was about to get up uh, from the back row and talk about the Good Shepherd, the minister burst into the room and signaled to me that he would be able to do the story time after all. He told the children about sheep, that they weren't smart, needed lots of guidance, and that a shepherd's job was to stay close to the sheep, protect them from wild animals, and keep them from wandering off and doing dumb things that would get them hurt or killed. He, um, he pointed to the little children in the room and said that they were the sheep and needed lots of guidance. Then the minister put his hands out to the side, palms up in a dramatic gesture, and with raised eyebrows said to the children, if you are the sheep, then who is the shepherd? And he was pretty obviously indicating himself. A silence of a few seconds followed. Then a young visitor said, Jesus, Jesus is a shepherd. The young minister, obviously caught by surprise, said to the boy, well, then who am I? And the little boy frowned and then said with a shrug, I guess you must be a sheepdog. Since I remember the look on that young minister's face every time I get to thinking that I'm the shepherd in charge of some of God's sheep. It's a, it's a good point to make. Um, the last verses of uh, Daniel chapter four, um, Nebuchadnezzar um, says this, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, um, all of whose works are truth and his ways justice, and those who walk in pride he's able to put down. 
And he was talking about himself at that point. 23 years later, we have Belshazzar. And let's pray before we get into it. Father, we just want to come before you and thank you, Lord, for um, what your word has to say. Um, God, we thank you for uh, the examples, good and bad, of what it means to um, walk with you and especially uh, to walk humbly in your sight. And Lord, as we go through and talk about this man, uh, this man's life and this man's end, uh, Father, we just pray that you uh, speak to our hearts about the issues that need to be taken care of. And we ask that you do this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let's go through and read some of this. Um, in chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Belshazzar, the king, made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in the presence of the thousand. While he tasted the wine, Belshazzar gave the command to bring the gold and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple which had been in Jerusalem that the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken from the temple of the house of God which had been in Jerusalem. And the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze and iron, wood and stone. In the same hour, the fingers of a man's hand appeared and wrote opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace, and the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance changed, and his thoughts troubled him, so that the joints of his hips were loosened, and his knees knocked against each other. The king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, the, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. The king spoke, saying to the wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and tells me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck, and he shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Now all the king's wise men came, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king its interpretation. Then King Belshazzar was great, greatly troubled, his countenance was changed, and his lords were astonished. The queen, because of the words of the king and his lords, came to the banquet hall. The queen spoke, saying, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts, thoughts trouble you, nor let your countenance change. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy God. And in the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him chief of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers, inasmuch as an excellent spirit, knowledge, understanding, interpreting dreams, solving riddles, and explaining enigmas were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will give the interpretation. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king spoke and said to Daniel, are you that Daniel who is one of the captives from Judah, from my father the king, uh, uh, whom my father the king brought from Judah? I have heard of you, that the spirit of God is in you, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Let's stop right there. Let me just do some uh, historical stuff for you right now. Um, this is almost 70 years at this point from the events that you have in Daniel chapter one. Um, after uh, Nebuchadnezzar had reigned for about 43 years, um, he dies. And he's followed by his son, uh, and his name is Evil Merodach, um, and he reigned two years. But his reign was arbitrary, which just means he just did what he pleased. Was, um, bad politician, basically. It's arbitrary, and he was licentious in the sense that he, um, he was just one of those guys that um, did whatever he wanted sexually, um, lustfully. And so he ended up being assassinated by a guy named Neraglissar. And Neraglissar was a son-in-law of Nebuchadnezzar. Neraglissar dies four years later of natural causes, and he's succeeded by a guy named Laborosoarchad, and he's the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. Um, he reigns one year, and he's assassinated, and then a guy named Nabonidus assumes the throne in 556 BC. All that happened in six years. So Nebuchadnezzar dies, all that, takes, all that stuff takes place in six years. And so um, uh, he begins his reign in 562 BC, and he reigns until 539 BC, and it's he that is conquered by the Medes and the Persians. And that's what's gonna happen at the end of this, of this chapter. But you've got this guy Belshazzar that's there. Um, and Nabonidus isn't mentioned in uh, chapter five. 
Um, Belshazzar is the son of Nabonidus by either a wife of Nebuchadnezzar or a daughter of Nebuchadnezzar. One of the things that you would do, Nabonidus wasn't a relative to Nebuchadnezzar. He either married a wife or a daughter, and we've been talking about this on Sundays. Um, when you married the um, wife, uh, the, the previous wife of a dead king, it gave you a right to the throne. Um, and that's what Nabonidus was doing. So it's either a wife of Nebuchadnezzar, you've got to remember it's only six years after Nebuchadnezzar has died. He either, either marries a wife or he marries a daughter. Um, in this passage here, the queen uh, keeps calling Nabonidus, actually he calls Nebuchadnezzar the father of uh, Belteshazzar or Bel Belshazzar. Um, the word father in the Old Testament is a term that could be used for your father, or it could be used for your grandfather, or it could be used for your great-grandfather, or it could be used for your great-great-great-great-great-grandfather, because the Jews didn't have terms for grandfather. There was only fathers. And so um, you'll see that through, throughout the Old Testament, and uh, neither did most of the ancient peoples. Um, obviously, the, we're talking about Babylonians here. And so Belshazzar is most likely a grandson of Nebuchadnezzar by his mother, not by his father, by his mother, okay? Um, because he is a grandson by his mother, he actually has the right to the throne, while Nabonidus doesn't, because he's not in line. He doesn't have, he doesn't have royal blood. And so he's only in line because he's married somebody that's connect, connected to Nebuchadnezzar. And that's why um, when... Uh, when Belshazzar uh, sees the writing on the wall and wants the interpretation, it's why he says, I will make him the third ruler in Babylon. He can't make him the second ruler because he's not the first. Nabonidus, his father, is first ruler. He's, called, he's what's called a co-regent. He, he's co-reigning with uh, Nabonidus. And so the next step down from him is third ruler. That's why, that's why you have that in that passage. Um, this is approximately 23 years after chapters um, four and five, and chapters seven and eight were written during the time of Belshazzar, okay? So we're gonna go from chapter five to chapter six with Daniel in the lion's den, and seven and eight go back to basically the time of, of chapter five. Um, this whole story, used to be used as ammo against the Bible. And the reason it was, or uh, specifically against the book of Daniel, and the reason it was used as ammo is because we didn't have the name of Belshazzar in um, archeology. span They hadn't found his name yet. But uh, since the, uh, the time that, that the book of Daniel used to be attacked in this area, um, they've dug up clay cylinders with the name Belshazzar on it, and he's called the son of Nabonidus. And so this is one of those things that critics of the Bible went to and said, see, the Bible's, you know, full of baloney. It's not historically accurate. It talks about, Bel about Belshazzar and Belshazzar never existed. And they said Belshazzar never existed because they never found his name. Well, the fact that you don't find somebody's name in a dig someplace doesn't mean that he didn't exist. And it's one of those, th one of those uh, things that people who attack the Bible, they make the same mistakes over and over and over again. They are assuming that we have all knowledge about uh, events that took place thousands of years ago, and we don't. And so we have these situations all the time where people will make these radical statements about um, how the Bible's false. Like for example, did you know that there are people who actually don't believe that David or Solomon ever existed? And um, it wasn't that long ago that you have, and you still have some, uh, liberal theologians who will do this nonsense, but it wasn't that long ago that um, all of academia was questioning whether or not David ever existed and still, until they started turning his name up in archaeological digs um, in Israel and uh, you know, specific kings in the line of David who talk about being of the household of David. Same thing with Solomon and, then, and that kind of stuff. And so whenever you, whenever you hear this stuff, people attacking the Bible, usually um, what's going to happen in, in those instances is within 50 years, they're going to look like idiots. And that's the way that it goes. It's been, you know, that, that stuff has been going on for, for years and years and years, since the 1700s. There was a group in, in the 1700s called the French Society. 
um, who talked about the fact, you know, about the fact that within 50 years Christianity was going to come to nothing because of all their, you know, their issues that that they were bringing up against the uh, against the Bible. Within 50 years, all the issues was answered, and the French society didn't exist anymore. And so, you know, God, God has God has this whole thing. A uh, uh, guy named um, uh, Voltaire did something along the same lines. He made a statement that. Um, uh, the things that he was doing as far as exposing Christianity was going to destroy Christianity within, you know, I think I believe it was like 75 years. Seven, uh, after Voltaire died, and he died miserably, by the way. There, uh, he was a, a French philosopher, and the nursemaid who watched him uh, said that she would never uh, uh, attend the death of a non-believer again because he screamed and begged and wept and cried so piteously. In any case, he died miserably. And 75 years later, they were using his house to print Bibles. And so, you know, God's got this sense of humor on, on these issues. And it's, a, you know, it's the same thing with this. And so they've, they've, they found evidence that Belshazzar, oh, you know, lo and behold, actually existed and that he was the guy who was in charge of Babylon at the time when the Medes and the Persians took it. And so, wow, isn't that amazing? Um, Nabonidus, um, Belshazzar's dad, had left uh, for Tema in Arabia, basically went down to, to what we would call Saudi Arabia. About 553 BC, he returned uh, when the uh, Persians rose up against the Babylonians. And by this time, actually the day before, uh, the, the events that take place in this passage, the day before um, he had taken off and fled Babylon and he was captured later on um, and uh, he, he went uh, into a battle. He was captured in that battle and he ended up dying in exile when Cyrus the Persian sent him off. And so that's the situation that we've got. Okay, um, in... Uh, again, historically, there's, a, there's another um, situation that I haven't told you about. Um, while Belshazzar is having this party with a thousand of his nobles and his wives, there is a, an army of the Medes and the Persians right outside the city. And so um, Belshazzar, it looks like, is um, just kind of doing the arrogant thing because he thinks that he's absolutely secure, that there's no way that the Medes and the Persians could attack him. And um, normally, he would have been right. Um, the walls, we have um, histories that describe the walls of Babylon at this time, and they were described as being 14 miles square. So when you went around the outside of the city of Babylon, you had 14 miles of walls. Um, they were 87 feet thick, and you could ride four chariots side by side across the top of them. They were 350 feet tall, and they had a uh, hundred bronze gates in the walls. Um, not only that, there were um, inner and outer walls with moats that again made the city secure. Um, there were hundreds of towers that towered 100 feet above the walls. And so the walls themselves were 350 feet tall, 87 foot thick, and then you had these towers that were 450 feet tall that loomed over these things. And obviously they've got people that can shoot arrows from those areas. And the Euphrates River flowed right down the center of the city. So they had, the, they had basically a gate that the Euphrates River flowed through, and then they had walls on, on the inside of the city on the banks of the Euphrates River. And they had bridges that went over. They even had a tunnel that went under the Euphrates River. And they also had gates in the walls on the banks of the Euphrates River so that you could get to the river. And so these guys had a river going through the middle of their city. They had water forever. And because they were prepared for the um, siege of the Medes and the Persians, they had 20 years of food stocked up inside of Babylon. And so these guys are feeling no pain. They're not worried about um, what's going to go on with the uh, Medes and the Persians at all. There were also gates that were on those um, gates going into the river. There were sluices. There were gates that they would lower down, in, down into the river so you couldn't, you couldn't pull a boat into the middle of the city of Babylon, okay? And so they're pretty protected. They got, they got everything going. 
um, uh, they've um, even found the palace that this took place in. And they've got the measurements of it. The palace was um, 56 feet wide by 173 feet long. Okay, so um, let's see. This building is about 100 and... Uh, it's about 100 feet wide, and so 56 feet is, is probably right in here someplace. And 173 feet, the building's 150 feet long, and so you had another 25 feet and get out over to the um, admin building over there. That's how big this, this palace was, or this room was, that they were having the party in. Um, that's more square footage than we've got in, in this area right here. And we can seat 1,300 people. Here. That's seating them. That's not, you know, standing around having a party. So it's, you know, we, we know where um, the party took place. And that was the, the throne room. And the size of the feast is not something that's surprising. There were uh, Persian monarchs, for example, that had 15,000 people um, at a feast at a time. Uh, there was a guy named uh, um, Ash. What is that name? Ashus Nasirpal II um, had a feast for 69,574 people at the dedication of his capital in uh, 879 BC. So this is not something that's surprising. Here's the problem. Um, Belshazzar, in his arrogance, has decided to use the implements from the temple in his feast. Let's go through and read it again. Belshazzar the king made a great feast for a thousand of his lords, drank wine in the presence of the thousand. And while he tasted the wine, Belshazzar gave the command to bring the gold and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple which had been in Jerusalem, that the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. So what he's doing is he's taking things that were captured from the Jewish temple. You know what those gold and silver cups were used for? They were used for the sacrifices. The only people that were ever supposed to be touching these things were the, were the Jewish Levites, the Jewish priests. And so this is the ultimate blasphemy against the God of the Bible, the God of the Jews. And basically what Belshazzar is doing, uh, most likely here, is he's showing that his gods are stronger than any gods. And it's probably a proclamation that he's making to the, to the lords that are there with him so that they stand behind him in this siege that's coming up. He's showing that the, that the city and the kingdom of Babylon is stronger than any other gods of any other nations. And he uses the Jewish implements from the temple as his little example for that. And one of the things that he's not thinking of is the fact that there is a God who knows how to humble people. And, you know, he didn't remember the story that he learned on his grandpa's knee, you know, about the, about the God of the, of the Jews, the God of Daniel. One of the things that, that you see all the time is people who just come along and they choose the God of the Bible to make a mockery of. In fact, I was just um, on Facebook today and um, I was actually looking at um, the page of one of my nephews and haven't seen him for quite a while, and he's decided that he's an atheist, and he takes this heinous, blasphemous picture of Jesus and sticks it on you know, the, the cover of his Facebook page. And you know, one of the things that I don't get about atheists is why they never pick on Buddha. Why? I mean, why don't we pick on Muhammad? Why do, we, why, why do we never pick on Buddha, never pick on Muhammad, never pick on, on any, you know, never pick on Zeus? You know, there's all kinds of gods. Why do we never pick on them? And there's a reason for that. And the reason is because they have no power in the first place. You know, why, why, do, why do you never hear anybody say, Buddha, damn it? <laughs> have you ever wondered that? Why not? Oh, Buddha. <laughs> you guys are sitting there laughing. And it's because it's laughable. There's no power in the name of Buddha. But when you say Jesus Christ, and you use it as a, as a curse word, 
there's power in the name of Jesus. And when you, when you go, you know, it's, it's like, make, I don't know, just make it a, you know, taking a, a, a picture of a fat Buddha and sticking it on your, on your web page. There's no power in that. Mocking little fat Buddha. There's no power in that. But it's, you know, it's always Jesus. You know, the, the other thing that I've always noticed about Jesus himself is everybody's got something to say about him. Everybody does. You know what Jesus had to say about Buddha? Everybody who ever came before me is a liar, thief and a liar. You know what he said about Muhammad? Those guys who are coming after me, they're false prophets. You know, Jesus had, had stuff to say about other people. He didn't name them specifically, but he had stuff to say about them. But everybody's got something to say about Jesus, and they're always trying to get Jesus on their side and, and that kind of stuff. And why is that? And there's a reason. There's a reality to the God of the Bible. There's a reality to um, who Jesus is, you know? Um, and that's, that's, why, that's why people do that stuff. I used to work in, in construction and when, whenever anybody would say those kinds of things, like they would say, God damn it. And what I would say to them is, are you serious? Would you really like him to do that? Because if he does, it might not be a good situation. Because if God is going to damn whatever you are dealing with, you might want to step back. Do you know what the word damn means in the Bible? You know, it's the idea of judgment and bringing, bringing judgment down on something. It's old King James word. And so, and I don't mean to be frivolous with that whole thing, but you know, guys don't know what they're saying when they say that stuff. And when, whenever anybody would say Jesus Christ, in my presence, you know, they do something. They go, Jesus Christ. And I go, where? <laughs> it was so much fun. <laughs> I just, I would, and sometimes I would scream it from across the job, where? And they go, what, what, what? I go, where? Did you see him? What are you talking about? Well, you just said Jesus Christ. Did you see him or not? I never know what I was talking about. And then I go, you know, then I get into it with them and I just go, you know, Jesus said that he's coming back and that every eye is going to see him. I thought maybe your eye saw him or something. <laughs> and we take off from there. It was, you know, you, you, a lot of times, you, you know, I don't know. I think that, I think that sometimes Christians get too rowdy about that kind of stuff. You can, you can deal with some of that stuff with humor and make them, make them see what they're doing. And I would always bring up the Buddha stuff. I, I, I'd say, why didn't you say Buddha, damn it? Why didn't you do that? And they go, well, what? Why would I say that? You know, and, and they go, well, I guess, I don't know if I was in India or somebody, you know, someplace, and you know, maybe, maybe I would do it there. I went to India. They don't say it there either. <laughs> they don't say Vishnu, damn it. They don't, you know, it's like they don't say that stuff. You know, it's like, and, you know, again, it's because there's power in the God of the Bible. And this guy knows this. And so he pulls out the implements from the temple and he thinks that he's gonna mock the God of the Bible. And what he doesn't know is that there's this whole timing thing and, and Belshazzar happens to be in the middle of the timing thing. Remember I told you 70 years, it's almost 70 years from, from the events of Daniel chapter one. And what God had said to the Jews at the time of the deportation of the Jews to the, to the kingdom of Babylon, that after 70 years, he was going to bring them back into the land. Well, the guy who is going to implement that is the guy who's about to conquer the Babylonian kingdom. He's Cyrus the Persian. And it's one of his generals that ends, ends up uh, conquering it. And so Belshazzar brings out these, temple, these, these implements that were used in the Jewish temple. And instead of them being used in the worship and the, and the praise and the honor and to the glory of God, he takes his wine that he has dedicated to these false gods, he puts it in there and he has his concubines, the women he's sleeping around with, drinking out of it. God doesn't appreciate it. Then um, not only that, there is this whole thing. Let's, let's go on and read. Verse three, it says, and they, again, they brought the gold vessels out. And in verse four, they drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze and iron, wood and stone. In the same hour, the fingers of a man's hand appeared and wrote opposite the lampstand. It doesn't say a lampstand. 
it says the lampstand. When you, you know, um, there's this thing called the article in both Greek and English, um, uh, Greek, English, and Hebrew. And the article is the. Uh, it's, a, it's a definite article. Uh, for example, if I tell you, get me a chair, you're going to grab any chair, any chair that you got near you and bring it to me. Get me a chair. Doesn't matter what the chair is. You can tell. It's, 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 it's nonspecific. But when I say, get me the chair, you go, which one? And that's what, that's what an article is. And when it says the lampstand, it's talking about a specific lampstand, right? So he's pulled out the articles that came from the temple. And it looks what, like what he's doing is he's lighting his little party with the seven branch lampstand that came from the temple. And so he's got it in there lighting up his little kegger here. <laughs> and it talks about the fact that there is a hand that begins to write there in this same hour. The fingers of a man's hand, verse five, appeared and wrote opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace and the king saw the part of the hand that wrote and then the king's countenance changed. All of a sudden he doesn't have this little arrogant you know, look on his little snotty face and his thoughts troubled him so that the joints of his hips were loosened and his knees knocked, um, knocked against another, against each other. And so, you know, Mr. Hot Stuff, uh, Belshazzar, all of a sudden has his knees knocking, you know, just, just because there's a handwriting on the wall. That's where the whole idea of the handwriting on the wall comes from, it comes from this passage. And then he calls out, and I'm not gonna go through and read the rest of this, but he calls out and he uh, cries out for the Chaldeans and the soothsayers and uh, the wise men and says, whoever uh, in verse seven reads this writing and tells me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck and he shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. And so all the wise men can't answer the, answer the question. They can't do it. And so the queen comes in and it's probably the queen mother this, this could be one of the wives of Nebuchadnezzar. It's, pro, it, it's most likely a grandmother of, Pe, of Belshazzar in this instance. Could be his mother, um, but most likely it's a grandmother because she knows Daniel and uh, uh, she was familiar with him. And um, Daniel is called into Belshazzar's presence. And in verse 14, again, Belshazzar says, I've heard of you, that the spirit of God is in you and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men, the astrologers, have been brought in before me that they should read this writing and make known to me its interpretation, but they could not give the interpretation of the thing. And I have heard of you that you can give interpretations and explain enigmas. Now if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around your neck and you shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. And then Daniel answered and said before the king, let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. You can see Daniel's a little testy there. And the reason he's testy is because he's seen the blasphemy that this guy is uh, performing in the presence of God. I think that when guys blaspheme, there is room for testiness. And it depends on how they're doing it. Like I said, again, when I was dealing with guys, when, when I was in construction, a lot of times these guys are just, you know, they're just regular old, old heathens. They don't know what they're doing. Um, but once I would do that little scenario with them, Jesus Christ, where, you know, or, you know, God, whatever, God blank it and all, all that kind of stuff. Once I would do that with them, what generally would happen after that is if that slipped out of their mouth, which it would because Jesus said, out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. They didn't have a right heart with Jesus yet. And that was their problem. And so it would slip out. And whenever that would happen, those guys would turn to me and they'd go, Steve, sorry. And I go, yeah, you don't need to say you're sorry to me. You didn't use my name. Maybe you need to say you're sorry to God. You know, just just get, it, get it in the right place and stuff. Or they'd say, excuse my fr French. And I'd go, you know, I had a girlfriend in high school who took French. I don't think any of those words were there. You know, it's like, I would, do, I would do that kind of stuff with them and, and that kind of thing. But, you know, they, they would have that attitude. If somebody was just doing it in front of me and just doing it to get me, um, I didn't have any problem coming down on them. 
I didn't have any problem saying, hey, you trying to tick me off? Because that's exactly what you're doing. And I don't really appreciate it. And so, you know, and I was the foreman, <laughs> which is always good. <laughs> you want to come to work tomorrow? <laughs> In, in any case, uh, you know, I wouldn't have any problem getting testy with somebody who was just going around blaspheming my best friend. And I think that's one of the things that we need to keep in mind when we're talking about Jesus. I, you know, I don't, I don't feel the need to defend Jesus, but Jesus is my best friend. And so you better watch your mouth about my friends. I don't like it when people say bad things about my friends. It's one of, the, one of those things that will get me. And that's what was happening with Daniel and Belshazzar. Belshazzar was blaspheming the God that, that Daniel loved. And so he offers him all these, um, all these rewards. And Daniel says, you know, you can keep your stinking rewards. That's in the Hebrew there. I'm just joking. Verse 18. Um, yeah, and again, verse, seven, uh, verse 17 says, yet I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. And the reason is because he'd already read it. He says, O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father, a kingdom and majesty and honor. And because of the majesty that he gave him, all peoples, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whomever he wished, he executed. Whomever he wished, he kept alive. Whomever he wished, he set up. And whomever he wished, he put down. But when, the heart, when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne and they took his glory from him. And then he was driven from the sons of men. His heart was made uh, like the beasts and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. They fed him with grass like oxen and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till he knew that the most high God rules in the kingdom of men and appoints over it whomever he chooses. But you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, although you knew all this. So Daniel knows Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel knows Belshazzar. And I want you to notice that um, he goes through, and when he's talking about Nebuchadnezzar, he goes, basically saying, Nebuchadnezzar, now there was a king. And then there's you. And that is the point that he's making. I like that too. I like, I like that kind of, I like that. It just speaks to my heart. <laughs> Although you knew, knew all this, verse 23, and you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. They have brought the vessels of his house before you and you and your lords, your wives and your concubines have drunk wine from them and you've praised the, God of, the gods of silver and gold, bronze and iron, wood and stone, which do not see or hear or know and the God who holds your breath in his hand and owns all your ways, you have not glorified. Then the fingers of the hand were sent from him and this writing was written. And this is the inscription that was written. Mene, mene, tekel, you farsen. This is the interpretation of each word. Mene, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel, you've been weighed in the balances and found wanting. In other words, you're a lightweight. That's literally what that means. Perez, that's the, that's the plural of you farsen. Um, Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command and they clothed Daniel with purple, put a chain of gold around his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be third ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. And here's how the Persians did it. Um, Cyrus the Persian, who was the head of the Persian army, um, he was the king, took off with a group of, uh, with part of his army that was um, watching the supplies basically, you had different groups in the army. He took one division of men and he put them at the entrance gate to the Euphrates River. He took another group of men and he put them at the um, exit gate of the Euphrates River and he told them to wait there. He went up river and he diverted the, the Euphrates River into a lake and he told these guys that when the river got low enough to ford, that they were to go into, in under the sluice gates that were in the river and enter Babylon from the inside. Now, normally, the gates on the banks would be closed, but these guys were so arrogant, and it was not only um, Belshazzar that was partying, it was literally the city of Babylon was partying. 
um, because they didn't think that they had to watch the walls. And so basically the gates on, on the um, banks of the Euphrates River were open and these guys, these armies, uh, these two divisions came in from both sides and without a shot basically came in and took the city of Babylon and conquered it without a battle. They went into um, the uh, throne room here and obviously Belshazzar was killed at that point being the king of Babylon who was fighting against the Persian army. And so um, the, the passage was fulfilled literally. Now let me take you to something. Um, and I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna read these to you real quick. Um, these are prophecies that were written better than 150 and uh, in some places 200 years before the events. Isaiah 13, 17. It says, and this is speaking about Babylon, it says, behold, I will stir up the Medes against them who will not regard silver, and as for gold, they will not delight in it. And the, the kingdom that took the Babylonians was the Medes and the Persians. In fact, Cyrus was called uh, a Mede. Jeremiah 51, says this, for thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, the daughter of Babylon is like a threshing floor. When it is time to thresh her, yet a little while in the time of her harvest will come. Jeremiah 51, 36 says, Therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, I will plead your case and take vengeance for you. Talking about Israel. I will dry up her sea and make her springs dry. Talking about Babylon. Jeremiah 51, 39 through 40 says, In their excitement, I will prepare their feasts. I will make them drunk that they may rejoice and sleep a perpetual sleep and not awake, says the Lord. I will bring them down like lambs to the slaughter, like rams with male goats. Jeremiah 51, 56 through 57 says, because the plunderer comes against her, against Babylon and her mighty men are taken. Every one of their bows is broken for the Lord is the God of recompense. He will surely repay and I will make drunk her princes and wise men, her governors, her deputies and her mighty men and they shall sleep a perpetual sleep and not awake, says the king whose name is the Lord of hosts. Then Isaiah 45 speaks about Cyrus and names the guy. Over 100 years, uh, 150 years before Cyrus was even born. Um, Isaiah 45, 1 through 7 says this. Thus, thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him and loose the armors of kings. In the King James, it says, loose the loins of kings. That's what the Hebrew can say there. I'm literally going to make their knees knock. And that's exactly what happened with Belshazzar. To open before him the double doors so that the gates will not be shut. I will go before you, make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of bronze, cut the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that you may know that I, the Lord who call you by your name, am the God of Israel. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, my elect, I have even called you by your name. I have named you, though you have not known me. I am the Lord, there is no other. There is no God besides me. I will gird you, though you have not known me. All this speaking to Cyrus that they may know from the rising of the sun to its setting that there is none besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create calamity. I, the Lord, do all these things. And again, Isaiah 45, one through seven in the King James Version says, thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held to subdue kingdoms before him. And I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two leaved gates and the gates shall not be shut. And so God gives the battle plan before it ever takes place. And the tradition is, according to Josephus, that Daniel, when Cyrus, um, actually it was a guy named uh, Ugbaru, uh, who was his general, came into Babylon. Um, Cyrus came in, uh, this happened, I think it was on the 13th of October, something like that. 29th of October, Cyrus came down. And when Cyrus came into the kingdom, Daniel brought the scroll of Isaiah and laid it out before Cyrus. And Cyrus read there his battle plan and he read his name. And that's one of the reasons that um, uh, people believe that Cyrus was so open to letting the Jews go home. And so God had that whole thing set up. And there is a huge difference between biblical prophecy and anything that anybody else ever comes up with. There's a huge difference between it. And um, this, is, this is one of those instances. Obviously, um, we are people who are supposed to walk in humility before God. Obviously, um, uh, we are not to take 
the things that God does for us um, in a way that's lax. And what, you know, one of the things that's unfortunate about people who come to know the Lord is that their kids don't get it. Their kids don't get it. You know, a, a lot of us came out of a situation where we were in the world and we were pretty messed up and um, we came to Christ because we were pretty messed up. And then what happens with our kids is that they grow up in a Christian home. And you know, one of the, one of the things that, that you have is this whole situation where uh, those things that are familiar to you, you, you end up despising. Familiarity breeds contempt is how the saying goes. And so people grow up in Christian homes and they take Jesus for granted. And it's, I think it's one of those things uh, uh, that a Christian parent needs to really be paying attention to, that they just drum into their kids the fact that um, Jesus is real and that he saves you from junk. And, and uh, you know, my, my kids know that their life is absolutely different. It's absolutely different um, from what my life was. And it's, um, what, it's, it's normal. You know, a lot of, a lot of times kids uh, will come to me and they go, I don't really have a, a great testimony. And I go, what's your testimony? Well, I grew up in a Christian home, never did anything. You know, it's like what God saved me from. I go, your testimony is awesome. That's how everybody's life is supposed to be. You know, you're not supposed to have these situations going on where you have multiple, you know, multiple marriages, multiple dads, you know, going, you know, in a, in a situation where you go on every other weekend to somebody else's house and Wednesdays and, and all that kind of stuff and all the junk that goes on with divorce and, you know, then the drugs and, and all, the, all the garbage that a lot of us grew up with. It's not supposed to be that way. It's supposed to be good. And it's always awesome when I run into somebody that just has served the Lord from the time that they were little kids up to the time uh, that they're adults. Zach Lamberson is like that, godly guy. And his parents were Christians. And I remember when he was in junior high and we, when he really made commitments to follow Jesus. And, and he's, you know, he's been dead on, right on ever since that point and has never looked back. You know, and I, I don't think Zach's perfect in every way, but, you know, I know that the guy ha is, a, is a guy with integrity. Matt um, Kessie, same thing. Lindsey Kessie, same thing. You know, we got a bunch of people on our staff that just grew up in godly homes and they lived godly lives and they continue to follow Jesus and it's how life is supposed to be. That's what a Christian kid is supposed to look like. That's what they're supposed to look like. Not this idiot. And that's what he is. He, he knew what had happened to his father. He knew what God had to do to humble that man. And he went and he not only had the same attitude that his dad had when he was a non-believer or his grandfather had when he was a non-believer, but he took it a step further and just flat out blasphemed the God of the Bible. And um, he got the judgment that came with it. And so often you have, you have people that just act like complete idiots and take and blaspheme Jesus in ways that are, are just bad. They're just bad. And they think that they're not going to pay the price for it. You know, and it's again, because they despise Jesus. You don't ever wanna be in that, in that position. Um, you know, God is good. And he'll put up with a lot of stuff. And one of the things that God did with this man specifically was he prepped him for a life that should have been absolutely different. He made an example of his grandfather that none of us has ever seen. You know, it's like, I, I've never seen any, and you know, the, the malady that Nebuchadnezzar went through is one of those um, things that's actually cataloged. People actually act like animals. It's called zoanthropy. And so um, it's, it's a psychological order, a disorder, excuse me, a psychological disorder. And he had seen his dad or his, uh, his, his uh, grandfather most likely act like a complete madman and seeing God change his life and seeing God, not only that, but he held his kingdom for him. And yet he despised all that stuff and ends up in this position. And then he comes up and, and when, when his knees are knocking, you know, all of a sudden he's calling on Daniel. Didn't do that in the first place. His grandmother had to, had to talk some sense into him. Calls on Daniel and then thinks he's gonna do Daniel favors. 
in that. And, you know, the, you can get so far that, you know, you're, 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 for, you're too far to save. And what this guy should have been doing was falling to his knees and asking for forgiveness, not going, well, you know, I'll enrich you, Daniel. Go ahead and put the robes on him. Put the chains on him. That kind of stuff. It's just, it's just more insults. More insults. And he ends up getting the judgment of God. It's unfortunate when you, when you see a person who ends up in that kind of situation. God is good. And God loves us. And God does not want anything like this to happen. But you push it. And you push it. You push it. You can end up right there. It doesn't matter what your mommy was, was, and it doesn't matter what your daddy was, and it doesn't matter how often you've been in church, you can end up right there. And um, good lesson to, to pay attention to. The God that we serve is a God who, again, is good, but he's God, and I'm not, and neither are you. And we are to serve him, and we are to obey him, and we are to honor him. Um, we are not to act like the world acts towards him. And again, you, you got those, you got, we got a world that, that just goes around trashing Jesus left and right. And uh, that kind of that stuff needs to be um, spoken to. I'm a little intense tonight because of my nephew's Facebook page. That just ticks me off, ticks me off. I'm not, not gonna talk to him for a while because I'm too ticked off. Because of, because of what I saw. And, uh, um, uh, you know, it's, it's like you approach people with the goodness of God. So I have to get into a position where I feel like giving him the goodness of God. <laughs> so that'll be a few days. <laughs> and, then, and then I'll talk to him, you know, I'll talk to him about it. But it's just, it's just really unfortunate uh, because my sisters, you know, uh, every, you know, every one of my sisters are Christians. And my brother's not. And uh, his kids, it's just a bummer. It's a bummer to see, you know, just, just the stuff that I've seen in the, in the life that they've got now just bums me out because be, it could be totally different. It could be totally different. So again, that's, that's where we're supposed to live. And we get there, obviously, because of what Jesus has done for us. And so anytime that we're taking from communion, um, what we're doing is we're doing it in a way that um, blesses God, a way that honors him. And so the Bible teaches in 1 Corinthians 11 that um, when Jesus had given thanks, he broke the bread and said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. And you know, one of the things that always hits me about communion is the person, um, uh, the, the fact that it's personal. Jesus goes, when you do this, I want you to remember me. You remember what I've done for you. My body was broken for you. My blood was shed for you. And I just like that about God. You know, it's like, uh, again, I think, I think that a lot of times Christians can take the whole situation with God and just kind of kind of take it and, and, and place God in this place where, where he's at arms, distance or at arm's length from them. And that's not where he's supposed to be. Like I said, Jesus is my best friend. You watch your mouth about what you say about my best friend. And you know, I would do that with any of my friends. Actually, I would do that with you. Somebody starts slamming you, I don't appreciate it. You know, people in my fellowship, I don't like it. I don't like it. I don't automatically believe them either. You know, there'll be times when an unbeliever will say, say something to me. I'm thinking of one guy specifically, um, uh, say something to me about people in our fellowship and it just makes me mad. Just makes me mad. And there, you know, and it's not that I think you're perfect because you very well could have done, you know, somebody could have done the things that he said. But every time, you know what I've always found out about Christians? When an unbeliever is slamming somebody that I know, every time that I've checked it out, every single time, that I've checked it out, they were lying. Every single time. Doesn't mean that they're always lying. But every single time I've checked it out, they were lying. And so when I'm talking to somebody and, and, and they're saying something about um, uh, one of my people, that's what I consider you. <laughs> they're saying something about one of my people. 
I always take it with a grain of salt and I go, you know what? And actually I'll tell them that. I'll tell them every time that I've checked out anything that anybody slammed one of my people with, every single time, they've been lying. Are you lying to me? No, no, no. Just checking. And if they did that, well, they're sinners and that kind of thing. But I am not sure that they did. And then we'll talk about other things at that point. And it's the same thing with Jesus. Don't slam Jesus. Don't you, don't you have attitudes towards him? Don't you, don't you do that? Do that. He's, again, he's my best friend. He's my best friend. He saved my life. And again, that's that personal thing that you see in that passage. When you do this, you remember me. Remember me. And so every time that I partake of the bread, what I'm doing is I'm seriously trying to remember the things that Jesus went through. You know, the beating, the stripes that he took, the bag over his head. Prophesy, prophet, who hit you? I came from a rowdy background, and I've had people cold cock me. Had a, you know, I'm not going to tell you the story. Um, you know, just, just people come along and smack me in the face without me know, knowing that it was coming. Put a bag over somebody's head and do that. It's like you don't know where it's coming from, except for Jesus. Can you imagine if he, if he started talking at that point? Prophesy, prophet, who hit you? Well, that was Cornelius. <laughs> <laughs> Start naming names. If, if, if I was Jesus, that's what I would have done. And actually, if I was Jesus, bag over my head, the swing comes, I'd just go. <laughs> the name is name. But I'm not Jesus. In any case, Jesus took all, all that and he took it from me. And he took it for you. And then it says again, in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood and uh, this do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. I'm supposed to remember what Jesus was doing when he shed his blood. And what he was doing was he was paying the price for my sin. My sin cost him his life. My sin did. And not just my past sins, the ones that I'm gonna commit tomorrow and the day after and the day after keeps me from sinning. You know, it's like I, I'm, I'm really not interested in adding to the suffering of Jesus. It's kind of, you know, weird to think of. But the less that I do that's in disobedience to Christ, the less that he pays for. And so, you know, again, I'm, you know, I, re I remember Christ and I'm just thankful for the fact that he would cleanse me and he would make me somebody that's, that's, that's different than I was before. And so as we, as we partake of this, we need to, Again, be doing it worthily. He says in verse 27, therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord, but let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. And so every time we partake of this, there's a self-examination that takes place. You sit there and you look at yourself and you go, so how are things going? How are things between me and the Lord? And the thing that's cool about Jesus is that he always wants you. And even if you've blown it, um, what he wants you to do is he wants you to confess it and make it right. You know, the first people who blew it, you know what they did? Was they went and hid in the bushes and tried to cover it up. That's what they did. God comes into the garden in the cool of the day and he says, Adam, where are you? And he asks him, why are you hiding? And then he gives him an out. Did you eat from the tree that I told you not to eat from? And Adam didn't take it. What he did was he said, it's not my fault, it's hers. Pointing to Ben. <laughs> it's the woman you gave me. And she, not that Ben's a woman. He just needs a haircut. No, I'm just <laughs> No, he doesn't. <laughs> and then she doesn't take it either. It wasn't me, it was the serpent. And the serpent didn't have any arms. No, I'm just joking. You'll get that later. In any case, um, what, we, what we constantly do is we hide, we try to cover things up instead of just coming to God and going, yes, I did it and I'm sorry. And as soon as you come to God and you do that, what the Bible says is God takes your sin and he throws it far, as far as east is from west. He's already paid for it and he remembers it no more. And that's what we're celebrating when we do this. So we're going to sing. We're going to partake of, the, of communion. And uh, we're going to remember the Lord. Um, you guys can come up and, and take it when you're ready.
and uh, we'll just um, do it like we always do. Father, we just come before you and thank you, Lord, again for your goodness towards us. Thank you for, for the, the blessing it is to follow and to serve you. Um, Lord, we thank you for the, the price that you paid in sending your son. Um, what an intense thing to do. I, you know, I, would, I would much rather be in the place of Jesus than, than in your place, Father, in sending somebody else. And Lord Jesus, we thank you for the fact that you would come here and that you would take all that upon, upon yourself, the beating that I deserved and the death that I deserved. And you would take it upon yourself to give me what you deserved, which is heaven. So Lord, as we celebrate this, we just pray that um, our hearts would be right if, if we've uh, turned away from you in some way. We just pray that by your spirit, Lord, that you would turn us back and uh, um, in, in forgiveness, Lord, that um, you would bring us back into a right, right relationship with you and that this could, uh, time could just be a time of praise. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.